Welcome to Wealthy Living Conversations. I'm Lisa, your host and founder of Wealthy Living. It's here that I connect with a variety of wonderful people to have inspiring and insightful conversations to help you live a meaningful, connected and well life, both personally and professionally. So I'm going to introduce today's episode by quoting my guest, Natalie Martinek, when she said, you can't heal in a workplace situation or institution that continues to harm you. So with this in mind, we're going to take a deep dive into, into the common burnout state that is often talked about at the moment and bring awareness to the things that contribute to workplace toxicity that rarely get talked about in the workplace wellbeing conversations. So what it looks like, sounds like, feels like, as well as the wellness initiatives that try to cover up some of these core systemic problems. There is so much to the burnout conversation that needs to be addressed. And today, Natalie and I are going to do our best to try to bring attention to some of these things in this episode. So Natalie is one of my favourite people to have a conversation with and as such has joined me for a number of Wealthy Living Conversations. So like myself, Natalie does not shy away from calling out the elephant in the room and likes to challenge popular narratives to help others to consider the nuances that exist in any given context. So welcome, Natalie. Welcome, Lisa. It's great to be back on Wealthy Living again. Thank you. Uh, so good to have you. It's been a while since we've recorded an episode and um, I know you've been so busy doing such fabulous work and I'm so um, grateful that you've taken the time to come and join me today so that we can have this really juicy conversation. I'm looking forward to it. Let's go. Yeah. So let me introduce everybody to you a little bit more formally and then we'll get right into it. So Natalie refers to herself as the narcissism hacker. She's a relationship coach and consultant for leaders and executives in healthcare and related industries globally. She helps leaders and executives navigate professional and personal relationships with narcissistic people using strategic communication and relational skills while managing risks to their reputation and career progression. Natalie currently investigates and raises awareness about narcissistic behaviours, their early warning signs, the conditions that result in narcissistic relationships and toxic workplace culture. So she does this to combat burnout, bullying, moral injury and other trauma caused by a spectrum of narcissistic behaviours. And today we're going to talk about some of those um, some of those areas like burnout and bullying and moral injury, etc. So Natalie, the term burnout seems to be thrown around really loosely these days. There's articles yeah. everywhere. There's posts about it all through um, platforms like LinkedIn um, and a lot of you know common business magazines. But what actually is it? What does it actually mean? And at what point is someone considered burnt out? Yeah, you know, just hearing your introduction, it just makes me aware that burnout is normal. That's the normal. It's everywhere. This is just how it is burned out. And that in itself is problematic. So the term burnout was um, introduced by Dr. Christina Maslach, who's a social psychologist. Um, in 1982, and it was defined as a psychological syndrome involving emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and a diminished sense of personal, personal accomplishment um, that occurs in a number of different professions, professionals um, who work with others in challenging situation. So it is a state of physical, emotional, and mental exhaustion that is caused by depletion of an ability to cope with one's environment, and it results from our responses to ongoing demand um, and stress in our daily lives. So that's the way it's been defined, something individual, something that's happening to me as an individual because of my inability to cope with the stuff that's going on. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't really questioned the stuff that's going on um, yeah. until more recently, 
And the stuff that has been um, articulated is uh, aspects of a workplace culture, for example, um, as well as the tasks. So if you have too much work, so overwork, work demands, um, time management, work-life balance or integration, as well as being in a work environment where that lacks meaning, fairness, um, lacks community. So those have the, been the generic, some of the generic characteristics um, of things that lead to burnout. Um, and so that, that's what we're hearing. And one of the other uh, definitions that I do appreciate about burnout, and I think it also came from Dr. Maslach, is uh, an erosion of the soul caused by a deterioration of one's values, dignity, spirit, and will. Mm -hmm. And that's characterized by exhaustion, depersonalization, and low personal accomplishment. So erosion of the soul mm -hmm. caused by a deterioration of one's values, dignity, spirit, and will. So that in itself speaks to something beyond burnout. It talks about erosion of our morals, which leads to moral distress and ultimately can lead to moral injury. And we could talk a bit more about that after. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I absolutely, thank you. Thank you for clarifying all that. And I really love that second definition that you gave because I love the idea that it takes into account, I suppose, when somebody has this misalignment of their values and is consistently having to act in a certain way or go against maybe their own moral compass, like you talked, we can talk more about moral injury, but go against their own moral compass in order to belong, in order to fit in, in order to feel like they are um, uh going to give the results that their leader or their manager or the, their partner or in a, in a relationship or whatever it is, whatever circumstance they're in, what the other person needs in order for them to be long in that particular relationship or that particular environment. And I think that that's often not really considered or talked about. People do talk about the values conversation and values aligned actions, but I'm not sure how often I've heard the values-based stuff get put in the same conversation as the burnout stuff. Mm. And I love that that is actually being written about. And I'm not, I don't know, maybe are people picking up on that a lot or? Well, how do you measure someone's soul? You can measure productivity. There are mm. lots of metrics around um, what, you know, that we can collect that are, that give us indication of, a presence or absence of something, but measuring values, measuring dignity, measuring a spirit, a moral will, mm -hmm. how do you do that? So even though these definitions came out around the same time, that this one that I just talked about, the erosion of the soul, hasn't really been discussed as part of you know a bigger problem. It's been persons unable to cope, they need to be more resilient, here, let's create these fixes and other types of solutions so that they can now cope and, and tolerate probably very toxic and potentially abusive environment. And when we talk about burnout, we've been right now speaking about workplaces, but it's not just workplaces. Mm -hmm. We burn out in all types of relationships. We burn out <clears throat> parenting you know, in the early years, if you have a number of kids, not just early, wow. teenagers, <laughs> teenagers, <laughs> you know, if you're a carer for, el you know, elderly parents, you're a carer of any kind, there's the carer burnout, there's the burnout that happens in romantic relationships when there's codependence, or there's, you know, a abusive dynamic where you're at the mercy, you have to submit to someone else's needs. Overall, what we're talking about is a situation where one person has to submit to the needs of a, do a more dominant person or a workplace culture or any sort of environment. They're not able to express their, their, their values, what's right for them mm -hmm. um, in a way that is sustaining for them, that is life-giving. It's mm -hmm. draining because they have to do what is required, what is expected in order to feel safe, in order to succeed within that environment, in order to do what is asks of them and they don't have the space where they can exert their own will in this process because overall we're talking about inequality in a relationship or in an environment inequality that's the when we you know strip it all down that's what we're talking about here i think wow <laughs> that's um 
yeah, quite deep, really. And there are so many layers to that, even though you've made it in under one term, um, you know, and pinpointing it to that. And I'd love to go further into that in a minute and what that actually means um, in real terms. But one of the things you said in talking about that just now was the word drained, when someone feels drained in those situations. And it's very common for people to say, oh, my God, I'm exhausted or, oh, my God, I feel so drained or my energy is just so lacking and then give themselves a whole lot of possible scenarios or reasons why, but not necessarily put it down to inequality or um, toxicity in a relationship or a workplace. But how do you know the difference between, or is there even a difference, or does it even need to matter between drained and a little bit exhausted or feeling exhausted and burnt out? Like, are they different things or are they one of the same? Yeah, you're getting me thinking about what's the difference. So the drained is like you you feel like, your life force is being actually drained out of you. So you can go to sleep at night, you can go to bed early, do all the sleep hygiene things and you get your eight hours, you wake up and you feel like you haven't slept at all mm. and you're drained. You, can, you just don't recharge through the sleeping process um, because something is still pulling your life out of you. Whereas, and so that is a feature of burnout where you, no sleep's enough. And some people call that depression as well. They're you know overlapping. Depression might be a feature as well, where you just feel like you have no energy and you have lots of negative thoughts about yourself, um, like highly negative overall about your work, about your perception of self, about others. Um, you go into a very critical place. Um, and the exhaustion is... You can feel exhausted, but you can replenish. So exhaustion is short term, as drained is more long term. And, you know, I think we've all had those experiences where we could have a conversation with someone and it doesn't seem like anything happened in that conversation. It seemed to be going OK, um, but you left that conversation feeling like you've lost all this energy, like you were drained. Mm -hmm. So something did actually happen in that conversation. But if it's been a familiar dynamic, you're not going to know exactly what went on that contributed to you feeling drained. And you weren't feeling that way when you started that conversation. It's a result of that conversation. But often we don't attribute it to this little benign conversation. Um, we think, oh, there's something else that's not right for me, not right in me. Maybe I'm getting sick. Maybe, um, you know, I ate something weird. So it's these observations about our way of being with every minute, you know, every moment to moment. So if you don't spend the time in a work day, taking a pause to really go, okay, where am I at? How am I feeling? By the end of the day, you will likely feel drained, but you won't know what was the thing that contributed to your drain. It might be a whole bunch of things that occurred because overall the environment is toxic. So every interaction is going to have an essence of negativity to it, but because it's so normal, it's the status quo. You don't really question it until mm -hmm. something happens that causes you to finally go. I don't, I'm not accepting that this is just how it is. Yeah. So I don't know if I answered the question sufficiently, right? What's the difference between drain yeah. and exhaustion? Is it burnout? Is it a feature of burnout? Um, it's one of the many features of burnout. Yeah. Yeah. No, you definitely, definitely um, answered it. So one of the things, like, as you were talking and then you and then you brought up the word pause, that was what came to mind when you were just talking then because I was like thinking, okay, well, if this is a situation and you have these conversations with somebody and you might attribute them to a whole lot of other, a whole lot of other reasons, how do you then know? And I think I agree with you. Well, I do agree with you that there's just so much power in the pause. And that's probably, I would think, and I'm wondering, do you agree, is, is that a good starting place for people to start noticing what's going on, being paused to notice what's going on within the body, what's going on with the mind, and how are they feeling? Mm. Yeah, I would absolutely agree. And the question is, when do you pause? You yeah. know, you have all this stuff happening. That's right. Do you, 
schedule them in and then actually do them? Do you notice something, a reaction you're having and that's the prompt to, to pause? I think the point is, is taking opportunities to stop and go, okay, what's happening in me right now or with me right now? What am I noticing? What am I feeling? What am I thinking? Are important to just become aware of your inner landscape because like what we said is you spend a whole day doing your things, thinking you're ticking, you know, ticking tasks off the list, you're being productive, you're getting stuff done. You have something to show by the end of the day, but what you're also have to show at the end of the day is probably not what you expect, which is feeling drained, tired, exhausted, morally compromised, or like, you know, depressed, um, uh, feeling ashamed, feeling guilt, like lots of things that you wouldn't expect to be the outcome of a day where you were getting stuff done. And yeah. that, you know, this is, but then that becomes accepted. This is just, just how it is. Yeah. And I think must be something wrong with me. Mm. Yeah. And, and I think the, the, the challenge is for a lot of people that have been, and for most people, I think that they go along with the familiar and therefore that's the norm and therefore that's how it should be. If you were to ask a lot of those people to pause, they could possibly do that. But if you ask them then to reflect on some of that, those feelings and then so that they could maybe, you know, write a bit of, a few notes down or you know just to try to see some patterns that are recurring that could actually for a lot of people feel quite overwhelming and add to initially add to the feeling of overwhelm and exhaustion because they've already got a really long to-do list and it's something that they're not familiar with doing so it becomes a too hard basket and then you go around in this cycle. So how do we, and again, that's then the responsibility of the person. So how do we change some of these dynamics by not just putting the responsibility? I mean, it's obviously the responsibility of a person to see how they're feeling in any given situation or context, but is there more than that? Is there more than that on a cultural basis within, um, the dynamic of a of a relationship or the dynamic or culture that exists within a workplace well i think it goes back to the question that you've we've just been talking about we, we pause we take notice of what's happening now what what's the point of it yeah because i'm gonna you know what am i going to do with this information because what yeah. is going to cause me to do is realize there's probably some toxic stuff that's happening and i'm probably in a toxic environment or an environment that is toxic to me um, a culture that's toxic to me, that there's a way that we're interacting with each other that isn't conducive to community building, to belonging, to feeling at ease and safe and comfortable in my skin. I'm probably, probably feeling on edge and threatened and not quite sure of the expectations I'm supposed to fulfill because the person who's my line manager isn't a good communicator. So I don't actually know where I sit, but I just am told of what's not, you know, what I'm doing wrong. So that's going to contribute to a whole bunch of stuff. So I'm going to have all this awareness of when I feel like crap, what do I do with it? Because it's the system, it's the organization, it's the culture. I can't change that. It's not on me to change that. It promised a safe workplace. It promised an environment where I could thrive. I ain't thriving. I'm feeling like crap. Mm. I'm able to get stuff done, but the how of getting it done is actually not helpful to me because it's, you know, it's causing me to feel crappy about myself. Um, I came into this role feeling quite confident and good enough to embark on a new challenge. And I've come out feeling like I'm incompetent. I'm not good enough. I'm an imposter. Like this is the thing. So what do I do with this stuff? Mm. I can't do anything really with it except process it with a therapist. But how's this gonna do anything to shift this culture? unless someone's finding out about me as well as everyone else and actually have the influence to go, this isn't right here. We need to do something different. Yeah, absolutely. And it's huge, you know, I mean, changing something that's been a certain way and having a certain blueprint for many, many years is a really hard thing to do. So I came across a story 
just yesterday or a situation yesterday and I was having a conversation with a stranger in a store <laughs> and it was really interesting because I was also preparing for this conversation and it was really topical because they were telling me how their daughter was role at one of the big consulting firms or um, I don't know particularly which one, but that doesn't matter. Her role was to organise the new interns or the new recruits the an off-site. So they would come, the new, the new um, interns, and they would have what was seen on the outside as this fantastic opportunity where they're taken off-site and taught about the company, the company's culture, how we speak, how we act, how we treat customers, all of these different ways of being at that company. The training, I suppose, the training of how to be and how to be a successful employee within at that company. And I was listening to this guy tell me about this and on my mind was all the things that I wanted to talk to you about. And so, I was thinking, wow, um, and they see that as this great opportunity and what a fabulous place to work for because, look, they're taking me to this fancy hotel. We're getting to do some probably fun activities and at the same time I'm not going in blind to this company because I'm getting all this fantastic intel about how they want me to behave. And the first thing that went off in my head was red red flag, red flag, red flag. <laughs> and I went, okay, so they're grooming you. And they're grooming you to be a certain way and to assimilate to the culture that they want to want their employees to be like, regardless if it matches your values, matches your personality, your character traits, your thoughts as an individual, your thoughts as a human, none of that comes into it. It's like, this is how we do things and I'm going to groom or train you how to do it. <laughs> and then you're going to come back to the workplace after a week and that's how you're going to perform. So it's like this perception over performance and this image over impact, I suppose, in a lot of ways. And you, you brought up the word imposter syndrome when you were just talking then and feeling like not enough or having to be an imposter. And so I want you to talk about that. Like how does someone, does someone have to do it in a way, in their way or pretend to at least and feel like an imposter at times, except for draw on the bit of training that they just got to assimilate to that situation? And is that something that is going to lead to exhaustion and burnout? Yeah. Yes, yes, and yes. A yes. long story, but <laughs> it was very well, typical. It is. Good timing. Absolutely. So they, so let's, let's go back and think about the job application and interview process. So you see a job or you're headhunted for a job. And either way, you're invited in to become part of this organization. They're going to pay you to do this stuff that's going to ultimately supposedly help your career development. And they make it seem like, you know, this is, this is a good place to be because we're a big name. We have a big reputation. You want to be affiliated with us. This is good for you, kind of doing you a favor, but really, and we're going to pay you to do the things that we need you to do. And in exchange, it's going to help you. So it seems like there might be this, you know, sort of fair exchange. Yep. Then you come into orientation, you're whisked away to a fancy place, you're fed great things, you have, you know, entertainment and all these activities. So it's like what you said, it's a bit of the, we're giving you attention to give you all this stuff to entertain you. So I won't necessarily call it love bombing, but it's creating this kind of intimacy in this community. They want you to feel like you're part of a community who cares. They're looking after you. Um, and then you're given the cell. This is how we really need you to be because we need you to represent our organization. And in order to do that, you need to embody all these practices. Um, we don't really ask if it fits in with you. You've accepted this job 
you've accepted this position. So it's kind of assumed this is the next hoop you're prepared to jump through in order to be successful here because we've got this trajectory that's available to you. So you don't want to miss out on that. So that's how they kind of gaslight heavily about uh, by making it seem like this is a good thing. And it's exactly that. So they don't consider what your values are, what your um, identities are. None of that. This is what we need you to become. And it's so subtle or it's sometimes pretty obvious, depending on, on the person and their previous experiences of this. Like, oh, here we go again. Um, or, wow, this is great. And no problem. I, I can do these things. This is I'm a natural fit. Um, so that's the first one. And so they pitch this at you. And then it's modeled across the entire culture as you continue in your or you embark on your work in your role as you're figuring out the lay of the land. You're also going to be watching how do people behave here? Who are the alliances I need to be thinking about? Yeah. So this is the way the culture of practice is being modeled to you and it's telling you this is how you need to be. But if you're someone who's, you know, very um, has self-confidence, you're clear about who you are, you know what's going to be a good fit for you and what's not, you're going to have a hard time with this. You're going to already feel like this isn't me. I don't like dressing like this. I don't like talking like this. What, I have to say this thing now at the end of a phone call? Like, that's so weird. Um, but if you don't have a strong conviction in yourself, you'll be like, well, it's just, you know, it's just the script. I'll just read it. And then you, it's these small little allowances that you give that start to erode away at your identity because you're becoming what the organization wants you to become so it looks good it fulfills its obligations and you have submitted to it you are essentially assimilating into it like the borg in star trek <laughs> resistance is futile because there's all these things that you've tied yourself up with you might have you mm. know your income bracket is an important aspect of your lifestyle so you kind of got to stick it out you can't just leave a job when you've just started because it doesn't look good on your resume. There's like lots of things that keep you in that environment and you might be questioning things a little bit, but not, and you're not listening to the doubts. You're kind of gaslighting yourself going, no, nah, it's not so bad. You know, everyone else seems all right. I'll just keep going with it. Um, and then over time you start to feel imposter syndrome or you might feel imposter syndrome. Um, and this will happen every time you feel prom you get promoted or you'll be in a meeting and you'll put out a good idea and then that idea will be dismissed, but then someone else more senior will come up with that idea on their own. And then, you know, everyone get, you get they get applauded for it. So you're gonna start feeling like what the hell just happened? Um, you know, all these events start to make you doubt yourself and you can develop what is known as imposter syndrome where you doubt your own abilities and you feel like a fraud at work. And it's often a diagnosis given to women. There's data around this. Um, and it's pretty problematic because if you think about the foundations of every institution, they started by men, for men working in these organizations. And we can say, oh, but there's been change. There's been more women coming in. Sure, the population has become more varied, but the structure itself hasn't changed. The thinking itself hasn't changed enough to make room for people to be more than themselves and to harness this collective skills, competencies, abilities, expressions in order to build or to continue to build on um, the success of that company. It takes a lot of courage to be able to do that. So the imposter syndrome, um, when it's accompanied by the extreme shame where you come away from work feeling like you're, hurt, like you're just a waste of space, you have really negative thoughts about yourself, um, and your competence, you become so disconnected from your competence, you kind of look in the mirror and you go, who the hell am I? I don't even recognize myself because I'm also noticing I'm starting to behave in ways like the other leaders that I've seen that, I, that make me not like myself. I'm, I'm moved away from what has been important to me in order to fit in here, in order to succeed in here. Um, I might be feeling depression a lot of the time or in waves and I never feel like I have enough sleep. So, and you, you feel triggered more often. So these are actually symptoms of trauma because what 
is happening when we are assimilating into culture, it means we're dropping parts of ourselves, we're abandoning, we're excluding or suppressing parts of ourselves to adopt what the culture needs from us. So we're becoming not ourselves, we're becoming like a false self. And in exchange for prestige, money, recognition, whatever the hell that they sold you that you bought. So you can't just leave the work and you're not traumatized anymore. It's not burnout. It's, or it is burnout, but burnout as trauma. And um, from having assimilated into this dominant culture. Mm -hmm. And this is something we haven't heard about because the burnout narrative has been the key gaslighting tool. Um, on one hand, people didn't know that it was trauma. On another hand, there's stigma associated with trauma and no organization wants to think that it's processes, it's policies, it's approach is traumatizing because there could be lots of lawsuits associated with it. So we'll just call things like moral injury. So it doesn't sound like trauma. Mm -hmm. And in the definition of moral injury, it is it does speak to a trauma, but it's a, still a little sanitized. Yeah. So it's not quite clear who the real culprit is. Mm. Um, but it is trauma and you can't just recover from it easily just by leaving the organization or getting therapy while you're in the organization that continues to do this to you. So that's my long-winded description of what I think you're talking about. <laughs> I love it, Nat. <laughs> and, you know, I'm so glad I brought that, um, that story, that circumstances story up because there is so much in that. And I think that that doesn't get talked about. And, you know, I really wanted to have this conversation with you today to really bring to the light so much that is stays in the shadows that people do not want to talk about, that companies do not want to talk about, and that, um, yeah, and that, that that's real and it's necessary because if we are going to start to change we have to look at it from a systemic point of view. We have to look at it at where is this all starting? And yet that example I gave is of probably one of the most patriarchal, archaic um, <laughs> professions, which is accounting and consulting. Um, <laughs> but, you know, this obviously happens, I'm wondering, because, you know, you, you hear about this sort of stuff or you don't hear about it much, but I imagine in places like the medical industry, and consulting and accounting firms and all of those places whereby there is a pathway. So when there's a pathway, people can't, like before you mentioned about if people don't realise it's happening, they don't really speak up until it happens over again and then they notice, well, what's going on? Or why don't I feel good? Or the imposter syndrome starts to arrive or anything like that. But we've got to remember that in a lot of these things, it's a pathway. So they're going straight from school to university. They're being trained in one way in the in university, which in itself is an institution. Yeah. And then they're coming in as a graduate. So there's the graduate programs or the that have these orientations. I mean, yes, you've got new employees that are coming in that are going to be orientated, but not in the same way as the whole graduate programs. Mm. so um of the interns or whatever whatever different professions call them and so that that's a whole certain industries but there's industries that don't have those pathways as much and there's workplaces and corporations and even um community groups and so I'm wondering is this same thing happening do you do you see this happening across the board or is it specific to often organizations whereby there's more of a pathway? That's a great question. I think the simple answer or the short answer, it's not simple, is if whenever there's a, a, a governance structure of how an organization needs to run, you're institutionalized because you're beholden to the structure and the you know, the board or whoever is overseeing the operations of everything. When you're a community where you all, all the members are, um, you know, collectively responsible for how things run and there's no intention to scale up and to become absorbed as part of something else. They wanna stay true to the intention as well as the 
the function and the operation of what they're doing and they're able to keep it you know stay accountable to what they're doing um, then you're less likely to encounter these toxicities because there's enough people involved and invested who want to make sure that we take care of each other and that we take care of the business we're trying to you know run and the community that are working with us or relying on our service or our product so i think as soon as you formalize something and that hierarchy starts to build you you just can't because now you at the top are more obligated to serve whoever is above um, and less about the people below, although you might still believe that you're, uh, you know, influencing change or supporting whatever the needs of the community. Um, but I, you have to really spend some time being honest if that's really, tr if, if that's really the case, because there's these tensions and you see this in healthcare as well as become more, is it's capitalist. So you have, uh, you know, people who are sick, but there's a cost to everything. And there's uh, you set doctors sending patients out for tests and diagnostic things. There's a cost associated with that. And some organize, some clinics will get, you know, the money from the government to cover those costs. Again, I'm talking very generically. There are many different healthcare systems around the world. They operate in their own, in, in different ways, but there's incentives for seeing patients. Um, and so, if you think about the good old days when it was just a doctor and patient, there was an exchange of goods, services, support, whatever, between those two. There wasn't a third party insurer. There wasn't a clinic that had overheads. There weren't, you know, there was registration bodies and there was some accountabilities to professional development, but it's become more elaborate now. So you are pulled and responsible to so many other bodies as well as a patient or, and their families. So, it's moved away from, uh, you know, spending the time just with the patient, which is where the healing happens, mm -hmm. where the actual work happens. And there's all these accountabilities associated with it. And so how does somebody not feel drained and not feel hurt by that when they went into this practice, for example, medicine, not everybody, everyone has their different reasons for going into it, but for those who went in for the actual patient care, and the interaction and the learning that they would experience with that patient um, to enhance their practice, they're going to feel really robbed um, mm. of their experience because the stuff they learn in medicine in four years of medical training isn't what ends up happening in reality. And they start to get, again, exposed to reality and slowed, you know, over the years um, as they move from, you know, graduate from medicine into internship residency or registrar as they you know pursue their trajectory um, but there's grooming there's the assimilation every step of the way so I wanted to also say that this concept of assimilation trauma came from work observing medical trainees from you know different parts of the world and this is work that R Dr. Rupi Lega and I have just published recently about burnout in medicine and it's that it is assimilation trauma because they're assimilating into um, you know, a system that is racist, misogynistic, xenophobic, elitist, um, classist, like that's the reality. It's inequality in all these different ways. Mm. So who's gonna benefit from that? Really, who? Nobody. <laughs> Except for the one collecting at the top. Yeah. Financially, they'll benefit, but they'll be dehumanized. If that's the thing that they're buying into, then it makes you go, well, what's happened to that person that, that they believe that that's okay? Yeah. What's so when I, said, when I said nobody, I meant at a human level, nobody. Yes. Yeah. Nobody. So, you know, because when you think about it, if, you know, obviously in the medical industry, if you're thinking, you thinking, you know, whether it's a medical industry or another corporate organization or workplace, in the end, there's a ripple effect. So it's not just how it impacts the um, the employee per, per se, it's how does that then impact the patient who then impacts their family? How does in a, in a corporate organization, how is it gonna affect the customer or the client? And then, you know, like all of, it doesn't just impact the actual employee of the organization. There's always a ripple effect mm -hmm. of when somebody doesn't feel 
like they're working in alignment with themselves, their true selves, their own values, and they're being treated as the human that they came in to the, to the job being. And that, that has an impact because when, you know, like you, you were talking about that it's that um, which is causing a lot of the exhaustion and the drain and the burnout. And when somebody feels like that, feels mentally un, unwell, not in a mental, not necessarily in a mental illness, but just in their mental health, um, feels unwell, physical health as well, then it's going to impact everybody around them. Yeah. And yeah. so that then impacts, that does have a negative impact on the top as well because that's going to have a negative impact on the business line. It can, although there are no alternatives that the majority can go to. So no matter what, we're stuck with this system. Um, so someone at the top is always going to be benefiting from it because healthcare is it's never going to run out of business, really. There's no incentive for, for um, yeah. people getting well because it means, you know, the system becomes obsolete. So really what you just... A whole other conversation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you, you just des described again that um, the process of erosion of the soul caused by deterioration of one's values, dignity, spirit, and will. Mm, that original, original definition. Yeah. Yeah. So do you, like, one of the other terms that gets thrown around constantly um, in the last sort of year or six months at least is the great resignation or the great reset and how it's an employee's market and people are, are leaving in drones and stuff like that. Do you think they're leaving because they're exhausted or do you think they're leaving due to moral injury so that they're, say, they're, um, they're not aligned ethically with their, you know, their values aren't aligned ethic, ethically with the organisation and they're being made to do stuff that doesn't feel right? I think it, it depends on the industry itself. Um, so the only industries will all say that there's real moral injury is healthcare and the military. So that term came from military, um, a description of the uh, experiences of soldiers coming back from war and having to do unthinkable things, even though they had planned and prepared for it, the actual reality of having participated in, you know, horrific, devastating, um, you know, ending of life and civilian life and whatever um, doesn't sit well with them. And it causes a degree of, you know, shame and suicidality and just, it's not just moral distress. It's quite a different thing. And it's the same thing with medicine, having to take part in something that harms someone else mm. because you've had to violate your own moral code or your own values mm. in order to fulfill the expectations of a system. And you didn't have any other choice that you felt you didn't have any other choice. You didn't just walk off the job. Um, so it's more about the harm you cause to someone else through your actions. Whereas the way it's being used right now to describe the experience in a whole bunch of other industries doesn't seem fair because in accounting, you're not gonna be doing the things that you're gonna to have to do as an emergency physician during COVID, the peak of COVID and having to work out who's gonna be able to get one of our limited ventilators, who's gonna be able to wear PPE, you know, the protective equipment that we're in short supply of um so like the endless moral dilemmas mm. and things that they've had to do that have caused harm whether it's intentional or not doesn't matter um it's done and i did that because i had to i had to violate my values so i'm a victim and i'm victimizing someone who's in a more vulnerable position that's different than what we're talking about in a workplace where you see a bully you know you're a bystander to bullying and you can't do anything because, you know, if you do, you're going to be next in line as a target um, or you'll be fired or, you know, there's there's just these constraints that prevent you from intervening. Mm. Um, and so you'll feel distressed about it, but it's not an injury. It's not the same thing. Yeah. So I want to be clear about that. So this is another thing that business 
researchers or whoever consultants are trying to create some new industry <laughs> um, because the repair that's involved and so instead of just calling it trauma from assimilation there's this whole other dance that's happening mm -hmm. and it's no different to well-being in the workplace yes and burnout, well, that's that's deal a, with burnout in the workplace well that's an exact gateway i was gonna i was gonna say when you just said it's another industry that they're creating i was actually gonna say that's the perfect gateway to talk about the wellness initiatives i mean that's the biggest number one priority of a lot of companies right now it's like let's put on the chief well-being officer um, and that will solve all of our problems. All um, of our and, problems. You know, coming from someone like me who does a lot of facilitation in the wellbeing space, I am not opposed to uncovering a lot of it and talking about it and calling the elephant out in the room. And I think that there's incredible um, work that can be done in this space, but the, you know, a whole lot of lunch and learn sessions and, you know, other little feel good things are a good start sometimes and they definitely help people feel like they're um, being thought about but they're not going to help the systemic problem of burnout exhaustion etc so is do you think that the um the leaders within the organizations who are saying, let's just get a wellbeing initiative. Come on, let's just appoint someone to make sure that happens. Even if that person they're appointing doesn't even know what to start with. <laughs> um, do you think that's a cover up to just make it look like they're doing something? Ooh, only the deep questions. So let me go back to the previous question. When you asked, are people leaving because of, you know, they're finally aware of burnout? I think there's a number of reasons. I think seeing people leave gives people permission to go, oh, that's an option. I can do that. Um, that's one. Because in the past, it's like, you know, you want your long service leave. You don't want, you don't want to give that up to spend a little longer. I can tolerate this a little bit longer. Um, and I think people have just going, working from home and then coming back into office. I think people have just seen other ways of doing things. They're like, I don't have to do this here. So the exposure to other ways has, again, opened people's eyes. And some people have just gotten so sick that they can't actually physically work. So if they had COVID, long COVID, they some have become disabled because of the experience. So they can't actually go back to what they were doing. So I think there's a number of reasons people are leaving. Um, and is it an employee market? Well, if the systems haven't changed, is it really an employee market? They, they have the option of choosing the same damn thing. Like, it's not really <laughs> gonna, it's not, yeah, it's, it's not a better thing, I don't think. So now coming back to your big question about these wellness initiatives, are they just covering it up? Sadly, I don't think they are technically trying to cover it up. I think there might be some, but overall, I think people really believe this is the, the, the evidence around mindfulness and all these other things actually are true. And that in order to support you know, preventing burnout, we just build resilience. They have, they've been so assimilated and groomed, especially these well-being leaders, because they're the ones who've successfully assimilated in their organizations that they believe that they are a good choice to run with these well-being initiatives and to lead them. It's like, all you're doing is finding another way to get people to assimilate who have been resistant, reluctant, unable, to do that. So you find another avenue to basically do the things that were attempted on them before, but you call it something else. So it's more gaslighting in my opinion, um, because it's not addressing the root cause. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I definitely see how the idea of resilience programs are, can be seen as a form of gaslighting. So it's like, well, let's blame you because you don't have the coping skills for the things and the change and the different things that are going on with the organization. So I can see how that's a blame or gaslighting um, initiative. Hmm. And in the same time, I can see that resilience is a really important skill to have. And it's important to maybe have some resilience programs, but not 
if that if that is the only answer, as opposed to it also um, it also being the responsibility of the organisation to provide an environment that enables people to thrive. So if yeah. they're in providing that well environment, then yes, sure, a resilience program is great. But if you're only going to do a resilience program, then yes, I can definitely see how that is a is like putting the, all the responsibility on the employee, not the organisation. I think if the organisation was a safe and well organization resilience wouldn't even be a factor it's not even a conversation we need to have it's not a skill we need to work on it, you wouldn't need resilience <laughs> like it has nothing to do with anything yeah um, but what so, about but what about if if there's just it's just a matter of change management so you know even if even if it is a safe place to work but new things are coming like nobody likes unfamiliar situations so yes you can say if you're providing a safe place while we're having an unfamiliar situation I mean that could be a part of a resilience program I think it depends on what the resilience program is so if in the resilience programs you're teaching about having effective communication and how when you are struggling with certain changes that you have who that you can have these open honest conversations and a forum of of talking about it then that's very different than just um a program that gets them to do things on their own I, th I think the word is problematic in general you can have any sort of well-being anything and you don't have to talk about resilience because what it suggests is that you have to be resilient to the intolerable conditions of this workplace yeah, that's true you have to be resilient to the abuse that you are um experiencing in this workplace the exploitation the racism so it's absolutely not okay to even be talking about resilience in a workplace when it could be and it's not about the individual it's relational we are working with each other we have to work with customers clients colleagues the training needs to be about social skills how do we work with each other how do we communicate effectively so that we're not making assumptions about each other what do we need to be alert of when we're in a stressful situation we're going to be more reactive so how do we bring that, name that elephant in the room that we're all going to be stressed out idiots and how to make light of it and how to work with each other and support each other to get stuff done without hurting each other in the process. That these are the things that are needed, not resilience. The priority should be about how do we work with each other because we're making a whole bunch of assumptions when I interview you, you candidate into a role that you're going to be able to get along with everyone. But not only that, that everyone else is also well behaved, that you should you know, have to line up with them. It's, these are flawed assumptions um, mm -hmm. because we put emphasis on the wrong thing. We put emphasis on individual and not on community and on relationships and cultivating relationship and not relationships so that we can sell and make money. Sure, do that. But it's really about how do we support the building of skills so that when this employee leaves and goes somewhere else, it's going to reflect well on us that, you know, we supported someone's uh, capacity building in relational skills that translates in a number of different ways wherever they go moving forward, including in their families, including in their other communities outside of work. Wouldn't that yeah. be great? Yeah, it would be. The, the role, the mission of an organisation on their statement as well is to make better humans. <laughs> That's one of the missions of an organisation. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so much in this that we could unpack and um, and I'm just a little bit aware of time. Yes. And, um, and how much we've, you know, we've talked about. But I do want to pick up just quickly, and it's not a quick thing to pick up on, but... <laughs> But you did say earlier a lot about the system and how if we have this that, you know, you mentioned about, um, I suppose, in a way of still working in a patriarchal system whereby, yes, we've got a lot more women in the system, but we're still bringing that in in a system that hasn't changed and it's outdated and we're running off stereotypes and blueprints that we've been running off for a long time, even if we try to disguise them with new terminology and buzzwords and fun initiatives, in the end, the system is still running off a very similar blueprint. And um, 
and it's an oppressive one. So in a very short response, <laughs> or somewhat short response, where do we go? You know, yes, let, you mentioned conversations need to happen. We need to get better at communication. We need to learn better and more effective communication skills. But is it even possible to change blueprints that have been there for so long? How do we create new frameworks? It seems like such a big feat. Yeah. Uh, well, what's our experience of changing anything? You think about a house, you renovate a house, but the foundation's still the same. So it might look different on the inside, its configuration might be different on the inside, but the foundation is still as is. Mm. Um, and when we want a new house, we have to demolish the old one and build something new. So does it make sense that we put our energy into trying to change something that isn't at its foundation able to change we can add more levels sure but the foundation is as it is and will be so it's a question of where do we want to put our energy into this trying to make it in that system and for some that's a great challenge um, to be the best assimilated person they could be and then learn the system and that way they can then deconstruct and create something different an alternative a number of alternatives that can coexist with each other. I'm not about, you know, smashing shit up <laughs> so that we could just destroy that because we don't think it's working. Well, it's working for a whole bunch of people, allegedly. So fine, let's do something else. But I can't create something else as long as I'm still assimilated into that system. It's still in me. So I need to do some work and that way approach, some, approach this new task in a different way from a different lens because it's coming from a de-assimilated place. So that's my short answer. People can go have fun, try to change their energy into doing that. And I think there can be change. I think you can support the transition into more relational practice. It's being done, it's totally doable. Um, that effort is worthwhile for some and there are others who will never feel like they can function in any of these organizations and they need to do something different. And Kudos to them too. Mm. Yeah. So I'm just um, processing some of what you just said. Okay. Do you think that addressing, when you talk about foundations, are you talking about the foundations of the organizational foundations or can you, can it be approached, can it possibly approached by instead of addressing the foundations of the organization first, addressing the core foundations of the people. So personal core foundations of both leaders and employees and, and focusing on the personal development in order to then achieve the professional development and in a more, um, individualized, humanized way. Again, we all enter into an existing culture that we had nothing to do with forming. So you would have to pick apart that culture and um, ensure that you're not repeating, repro reproducing the things that are unhelpful. And that takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of investment that doesn't really meet the bottom line and the timeline for lots of companies so that's what I mean by the foundation it's the blueprint of what's there if you if you pick apart an area it can create a great deal of instability and then the whole thing will come down so it's not something people really want to be doing when they talk about dismantling to what extent are they dismantling and what do they think the end product is going to look like mm. what does that mean so again, I, I question people's use of their energy where they want to invest it. It's up to them. But what are the things that we ultimately envision for ourselves? Um, it can be you do the leadership training and supporting relational stuff, but then the organization will be limited in its capacity to change overall. 
Um, because this is the thing, once you dismantle enough of your beliefs and you challenge enough of your beliefs and you, you create a change, you'll start to see that this thing that you've been working on has rendered itself obsolete in your life. So you're gonna wanna move on anyway. <sighs> yeah, but I, I hope it's a helpful message because I'm proposing there are alternatives, create alternatives, but you've got to do the work on yourself. You've got to heal the impact of the assimilation, the impact of moral distress over and over, the betrayals. You can't just go from one place to another without dealing with the now mistrust that you have. You're burned by one organization. You can't automatically trust another one. You'll be burned again because you're carrying that with you. And we bring that into our, all our encounters in our new environments, our new relationships. So there's some work on ourselves that would be really helpful. So we don't bring that stuff and co-create the toxicity that's there unknowingly, unintentionally. But that's what happens. Yeah. And I mean, that's the same as... I mean, for people that might be listening today and they're not within an organisation, they might not have got to this point of the conversation if they're not. But <laughs> at the same time, it's not too different to what you would do in a personal relationship. Everybody talks about it's not a great idea to come out of one relationship and go straight into another relationship, that you need to sort of process and reflect and look at, you know, what worked well for you, what didn't work well for you, what sits well for you, what feels good, what doesn't feel good, how do I want to approach things going forward, how do I want to do things differently, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, I think that that's the same. I mean, working in an organisation is another relationship. It is. It really is, but it's just with lots of people. Yeah. <laughs> lots of different personalities yeah well it's with lots of different personalities as well as it's with the culture of the workplace yeah <sighs> so, ah. so much all our conversations are always going to be juicy and deep and that's why I love having you on the show Nats you bring such wisdom and such a different angle to so many topics and you do it so well with such depth such breadth such knowledge and such integration. So thank you so much for having this conversation with me. And I know it's not all comfortable for anybody who's listening. Some of the things we talked about might be comfortable, some of them not so comfortable, um, but you don't have to agree with everything we said. It, go and explore it further. Um, it's just, we, Natalie and I, love to have conversations that just bring to light some things that sometimes people don't think about or don't, don't necessarily put on their periphery. And so we thought we'd come on today to sort of talk about a subject which has been in the news a lot, um, across a lot of, is a buzzword with burnout and the great resignation, et cetera, and moral injury and sort of just take take it apart a little bit and um, I hope that you found the conversation really interesting and valuable and we would love to know um, what your takeaways are from today's conversation so yeah let, leave a comment let us know and um, and share it so that these sort of conversations can be spread more widely and people can start thinking more deeply yeah. so now thanks Lisa oh pleasure so how can people find more about you and get in touch with some of the fantastic content that you write and, um, and the programs that you deliver? Thanks, Lisa. Always a pleasure having a chat and you never know what you're going to ask. And you always make me think. You always make me go, oh, okay, how do I, how do I respond to that? So you make me work hard. So thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. I really do appreciate it. You make me think hard. <laughs> <laughs> the pauses with our eyes going up thinking um where can people find me i produce a lot of um content on substack.com so just look up uh the hacking narcissism on substack and i talk all about uh navigating toxic relationships of all kinds and all the different things that you'll encounter along the way when you've discovered that you're dealing with someone with highly narcissistic traits how you exit a relationship, um, how to, you know, how to create change and what not to do, really. <laughs> that's a lot of what I write about. You think that's a good idea? Think again. Here's why. <laughs> and you can also find me 
on Twitter and a number of you know social media platforms as well as my website drnataliemartinek.com or hackingnarcissism.com. Fabulous and I will put all of those links in the show notes below. So if you want to find out more about my services you can visit my website at wealthyliving.com.au or connect with me on any of my social media channels. So until next time, remember, connection is medicine.